Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. It's been great to see a few familiar faces today. Um, so I was asked to talk about my experience um, with the CRCs and now NHRA and working um, in bushfire operations. So I'm up front, this is completely my personal bias and my experience, um, but yeah, hopefully there's some useful insights in there. So the High Impact Weather Team in the Bureau's Research Centre has actually been with the Bushfire CRC and then the Bushfire Natural Hazards CRC and now Natural Hazards Research Australia for over 20 years. And one of the interesting things about that is it's actually been an effective partnership over a number of different individuals in both, on both sides of the organisation and over a number of different projects as well. Um, the slide that's up here, this was actually Graham Mills' work back in the early days, a couple of people recognise it, um, back in the early days of the CRC, um, looking at how we identify wind changes. And I was using this just this last summer when I was working in operations, um, doing the forecast for Western Australia. So we're still using the research in operations right now that kicked off in the CRC nearly 20 years ago. So why does it work? Well, the Bureau is an operational and a research agency, which means that a lot of us have got a foot on both sides of the fence, and that makes a big difference. The other thing that's been really successful in certainly my um, interactions with the CRCs is that there's been a lot of flexibility in negotiating deliverables. So things don't always work out the way you plan. Desiree and I, for those who remember Desiree, had a great conversation over, over coffee one time where we basically chucked out the research plan and rewrote it because half the stuff wasn't working, but we'd actually done a whole heap of other activities along the way which weren't embedded in the first place. So flexibility I think is really, really important because we don't know where the goal posts are and as we know at the moment they're constantly moving. Um, also when we're in an operational agency, the pathway for where these things are actually going to land can be a lot clearer. So it's easier to see how to translate through to an operational outcome. And one of the things I'll talk about a bit today is that the pathway to operations can be a lot clearer um, and personal relationships make a big difference and that goes across everything that I've experienced in natural hazards and research is that really a lot of it comes down to personal relationships. So one of the big um, research story, success stories in recent years has been the PFT or the Pyrocumulonimbus Firepower Threshold and I still think Kevin should have picked another name for it. Um, but the PFT was really in some ways a culmination of 20 odd years of research. So if you can remember back in Canberra in the 2003 where there was the Pyrocumulonimbus and there was a fire generated thunderstorm and the response really across the agencies was what the hell is that? We really didn't know to a large extent what it is. And in 20 years with different institutions and different researchers, we've gone from a place of not understanding what we were looking at to actually developing predictive skill in forecasting pyro CBs. And that's the result of a, a long research effort. So if we look at the pathway and how that actually happened, firstly there was looking at the observations. So going out and collecting a whole heap of data so that we actually had the evidence base to look at what happened. And then it was a case of understanding why it happened. And this is kind of the dry bit in terms of the research piece because you've got to go back and model the physical processes. So looking at large eddy simulation modelling, um, looking at coupled fire atmosphere, modelling a lot of trial and error, a lot of trying different techniques, a lot of playing around with the mathematics and sometimes it's not obvious where it's going to land or where it's going to take you. And that was certainly the, t the, the case with the early PFT work. Kevin spent a lot of time playing around and getting nowhere before he actually found a pathway that was fruitful. Then from that, it was really looking at what the results were from the modelling and the theoretical space and using that in the early stages in combination with the operational tools. So the operational tools didn't come in in a late pace, it was, okay, it was really in the, in the middle stages of how do we reconcile what the research is showing us with what we've got with operational tools. And then in the actual implementation stages, it's useful to break that down into two different places. There was the technical side of it, there was refining the research ideas and saying, okay, how are we going to deliver this um, and what does it look like as an operational um, platform, what does that look like? And then there was the people side. And during this process, Kevin came up to me and he had all these ideas and he had all these talks that he'd done and he had all this theoretical stuff. And I said to him, Kevin, just go talk to the operational guys about it. And he goes, no, 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 it's not ready. I said, Kevin, walk upstairs and talk to the operational guys about it. And he did. And that precipitated a whole set of new conversations. But it also meant that all the operational people were really, really involved and engaged in the latest parts of the research. And they got to shape what the operational tool looked like because they were using it. So it's that connection between having the researchers and the operational people, the practitioners talking to each other. Another thing to think about is this idea of what does the research outcome look like? And I think in this sense it's really 
important, particularly from our experience, to look at the blue sky and the applied research and where do we want to go without actually knowing where we're going to get to. Um, and blue sky research, it's probably not my thing because I'm more of a let's get an answer right now and, and use it. Um, but this, this case is the work that um, firstly Will Thurston did and then Jeff took over um, on ember transport and plumes. So the plot on the left here is some of Will's really, really early work on plume modelling. And you look at that and you go, well, I don't know where the ember's going to land from that. But that was the starting point and the building blocks for the work that Jeff did later. And on the right here, we've got the simulations of the Black Saturday fire in Spark, um, which again was another personal relationship in terms of getting it into the platform. Um, and then from there we've now got Spark embedded as an operational tool with Ember Transport in it. But it started 10 years ago with Will's plume work that didn't make a lot of sense at the time. So research can be hard, it can be tedious, it can be frustrating and it can have red herrings. And for those who know that I did a lot of work with Access Fire, I was ready to throw in the towel with that. I was, I've had enough, I want to go do something else. And Beth was the one who said, just keep on going, stick at it for a little bit longer. And then we had this whole cascade of really successful things that came out of it. And now Access Fire has delivered a whole heap of really, really useful research. So it's not always obvious um, and it's not always easy. By any, start, at any, by any case. But as I said before, one of the really, really important things is to keep on updating um, what your expectations are and adapt to the findings as, as you go along and renegotiate the goalposts. And that's certainly been my experience with the research is that renegotiating goalposts and moving things around when you're getting success stories in one area and heading up against roadblocks in another. Um, that's a really way, good way of making progress. And also responding to new events, and we're going to keep on having new events. So we've got to have space for those and have space to say, okay, what are we going to learn next after the next major event? And that was one of the great things that the CRC did after Black Saturday, was that very, very soon after, they had a whole heap of researchers out on the ground collecting data, and that gave us the ability to do a whole heap of follow-up research. And also during Black Summer, there were a whole heap of projects where we just hit the pause button and said, we're going to pick this up after we've dealt with the immediate operational necessities. Work. All right. My observation is that research can sometimes be lobbed over the fence. It's really important to think about who's going to use it. And I've heard researchers get frustrated because they did this great piece of work, but nobody's actually using it. But they didn't have a person in mind or a, an actual landing platform in, in mind. So that's a really important piece to think about and what does the landing pathway look like in the design. This is one of the simulations that we did at the Koryong fire with Access Fire. Um, and it was, you know, in the coupled model. But then Alex, who's down in Tassie, kind of let, borrowed off this work and he's turned the kind of plots and the simulations that we did in Access Fire and translated them through to Visual Weather, which is our operational tool, and rolled it out for all the states and territories so that the forecasters in real time can look at the same kinds of plots that we did in the coupled fire atmosphere model. And that was Alex going, I really like that work. How did you do it? Can we plot it up in visual weather? Of course we can. And how do we train everybody on how to use it? So one of the things there is that um, sometimes it's much easier to use ideas than what it is to use a really big piece of technology. And that's certainly um, the case with a lot of the work that I've done is you get an idea and you share it with other people and they can use it in operations. <laughs> Small projects are often more successful than large ones um, and part of that is because people have got more ownership of it and ownership is actually really important when it comes to research outcomes getting used. And of course it comes down to money, right Ian? <laughs> So implementation of some research can be a lot more expensive than doing the actual research and that's not always taken into consideration when the research project's set up in the first place. Um, AFDRS is probably a really good example of a project where the implementation <laughs> has cost a lot of money and a lot of, a lot of mental health issues for people, to be honest, because it's created a lot of stress. Um, so you need funding for operational testing, you need operational, you need training and you need the software. And sometimes for an operational system, the ongoing support and maintenance can be really, really significant. And the technology can be really expensive as well. So that needs to be thought about in, as part of the process. And my bias, it's all about people, so much about people. And years and decades of experience in people's heads really, really counts. A lot of what we do in meteorology in particular is about pattern recognition 
and a lot of it relies on lived experience. And it's really interesting for me when I go into CFS in South Australia in, on bad days, and everybody has been doing that in the same place, in the same seats for a long time. It's this really, really well-oiled machine because you've got a whole heap of people who have been working together, they know what their roles are, and it really works like clockwork. Um, really different to some other places where they're dealing with a hazard that they haven't seen before. Of course, you've got to balance that with fresh ideas and fresh perspectives. One of the things in my experience that the CRC was really good at was doing what we're doing here today, getting a whole heap of people together in the room and also giving them space to talk. And I think part of that was about having the formal side of it where you get to establish professional credibility and everybody sort of knows what you do and why you do it. And then there's the personal side where people actually get to interact. And those kinds of relationships precipitate a whole heap of research outcomes. So fostering those networks and collaborations across broad disciplines and cross-disciplinary is really important. In terms of where we go to next, and this kind of goes back a little bit to what Ian was saying as well, um, I think 10 years ago or even 20 years ago, getting the researchers and the practitioners in the room was really effective because a lot of the problems were in the researcher and the practitioner space. But I think where we're going forwards, we need to really think about who needs to be in the room and who's going to be the most effective people to have in the room to actually get the research used. And I don't think it's just about researchers and practitioners anymore. It's really about bringing some of the policy people into the discussions. And I'm sure they're real people too, and they've got personality and they'll be fine. Um, another thing is the training and development of people. Um, we've really got to make sure that we're still continually developing people and there's that argument, if, if we've got $3 million, are we better off spending it on new research or are we better off spending it on training to share the research learnings that we already have with a broader run, range of people? I don't know the answer to that. I'm sure it's a balance of both, um, but I'm not sure that we've got the balance right at the moment. Um, my, my experience, again, is that during emergency situations, when p things happen really, really fast, usually, it's the expertise in the room in that emergency management space which is really important. From a forecasting point of view or from a meteorology point of view, there's three different phases. There's a the forecasting bit where you're leading in, in the week ahead or in the days ahead, um, like the blackout storms that we had in South Australia. There were really good forecasts a week out for that. Then there's the now casting. There's the bit where you've actually got the event happening and you're reconciling with your conceptual model of what you thought was going to happen with what the observations are actually telling you is happening and making sure that you're adjusting your expectations and you're adjusting your response in real time and that you're sharing effectively that information with everybody who needs to know. And then the other bit is hindcasting. And we had a bit of a going joke when I first started forecasting in South Australia that one of our managers was an excellent hindcaster and he was really good after the event at telling everybody what he would have put on the forecast. Yeah. But that's not always useful, right? So the important stages are in that forecasting space and in the nowcasting space and making sure that the information is being shared effectively. Um, the other thing I think that my experience with the CRCs um, is that it's really difficult to measure the benefits or the success of those decisions that are made and the value of relationship building. But even though it's not a nice tangible thing and a measurable thing that you can put a number on, it doesn't mean that it's not really important. All right, emergency management's really complex. <laughs> Everyone in the room knows that. Um, one of the things, um, that I've seen in researchers, particularly introverts, interestingly, if you get introverts in a space where they're collaborating on a project, they really, really enjoy it most of the time. But the funding models that we have don't always support this. And we've got a lot of projects that are happening in silos. So I know it's not a real word, I think, but how do we unsilo pro projects or desilo projects and actually get more different people with different ideas collaborating into a space? One of, the things, oops, sorry, one of the things that can be really useful in that is pre-operational trials. So before you take something into a, a true operational space, you use a test bit um, to test it. And some of the forecasting that was done in the lead up to the Sydney Olympics is a good, good example of that. And also sharing learnings across disciplines and throughout the sector. Um, another thing that I think, in my personal experience, is that delivery of the complex science during unfolding events can be really important. So this was me briefing Shane and the Premier during the Black Summer fires. Um, and the cutting edge science, even though it's not necessarily published yet, it can really be really, really important in um, helping decisions, but it also helps build credibility as well, and it also builds trust. So after the Gracemere fire burnt into Rockhampton, I think it was in 2018, I sat in Queensland in the Disaster and, Man Disaster and Emergency Management Room um, with the Commissioner and the Premier, 
and we had a lovely chit chat about fire science and they were really interested <laughs> in fire science and the dynamics of what was going on. So it's, your audience isn't always who you think it's going to be but there's a lot of people who are really interested in not just the traffic light simplicity, um, green, red, whatever in between, um, but that really complex science. So it's about making sure that we're sharing the complex science um, in the most effective way and using the opportunities that we have to share that science in an effective way as well. So traffic light simplicity, AFDRS, it's got a time and a place, but my experience is the complex science has a time and a place as well, and that's what builds the credibility for next time. All right, this is my soapbox slide. <laughs> And um, what we're seeing at the moment is that climate change isn't really manifesting in one and a half degrees or two degrees of global warming over a period of decades. The impacts are manifesting through synoptic scale and mesoscale weather systems. And there's really good reasons for that. So the intensity and the duration of weather events is changing across the whole kind of gamut of hazards. And as Ian pointed out, a lot of this is actually more impactful than lived experience. In Australia, we have had over the past few decades major investment in climate research. I don't know if it's in the millions or the billions, but there's been a lot of money in climate research. And in comparison, there's been very little investment in mesoscale meteorology and synoptic scale meteorology, particularly in the university sector, and it's been distilled down across the board from where we were 20 years ago, um, and particularly in applied research, which is the fun stuff. <laughs> And for Meteorology 101, um, the reason we have weather is because it's warmer at the equator and colder at the poles and the Earth spins. That's it. That's why we've got weather, because the atmosphere is fluid. Um, so if you warm the poles and the equator at differential rates, which is what's happening at the moment, you actually change your weather patterns. And this is largely driven by the upper parts of the atmosphere, the jet streams, and what's happening in, above the surface. And what's happening at the surface is effectively a reflection of that. Now, the reading I've been doing recently, which is really interesting, tells us there's a lot of uncertainty on how well these processes are resolved in climate models, partly because they're really hard to verify. Um, and there's also limited capture in the operational uncertainty. So I've always liked the saying, um, all models are wrong, but some, some models are useful. But the models are only really useful when you've got skilled practitioners looking at them and interpreting them and then communicating the results of those models in a really meaningful and contextual way. So in my mind, there's a really massive opportunity for uplift at the moment in what we're doing in Australia and mesoscale and synoptic scale meteorology to get better outcomes and better communication in communities. And what we're doing here is actually a few steps behind what we're doing, what's being done internationally. So some of the work that's coming out of the United States and Europe is ahead of what we're doing here and they actually have a much bigger capacity than what we do. Um, Chuck Doswell, who was an American thunderstorm forecaster, had the really nice quote, if you haven't thought about it before it develops, you probably won't recognise it when it does. And this is going to have been the case in all emergency management, that if you haven't thought about are you going to see a hook echo and a hail flare on your radar or a mesoscale circulation, um, which is a mesoscale tornado, if you haven't thought about those things, you're not going to be looking for them in real time and you're not going to recognise them when they're happening. So building that capability is really important. So for me, um, talked to a few people about how the kids are going today, <laughs> um, starting school. What's our legacy for the next generation? And just a quick show of hands, how many people reckon they'll still be working and not retired sitting on a beach when the NHRA wraps up in eight, and a half, eight years' time? Just. <laughs> so there's going to be quite a few people in the room. And this, this is really a legacy for the future, for the next generation. Um, what natural hazards are going to be occurring? What does a heatwave map look like in 10 years' time or 20 years' time? In, I think there's a couple of different questions here. What resources and technology are going to be available? And also what skills and capabilities are going to be needed? And I think we spent a lot of time talking about the resources and the technology, and we've actually spent less time and less thought thinking about what the skills and the capabilities are going to be and how we actually develop those skills and capabilities now or start developing them now so that people are ready in 10 years' time or 20 years' time. One of the things that we can do is have less partitioning across fields. So what we know is that when we get people in a room who are experts in an area, um, they actually all that, that, that expertise actually translates really, really well into other areas. So I mean, I'm not a TC forecaster, but I review TC papers because what I know about forecasting and meteorology translates really well. But we don't necessarily have those opportunities to interact um, in the research space. My experience is that the breadth and depth of experience 
um, across a whole range of areas is really important. So as Sarah said in the intro, I've worked across the country in a whole range of different spaces and I was in a room the other day just with agriculture people and the same kind of ideas of what we were talking about with boundary layer dynamics in fires can be applied to a whole heap of agricultural um, issues as well. And that breadth and depth of experience is what gives me the ability to contribute in a whole wide range of spaces and provide really contextual interpretation and information. And what we're seeing coming out of the university sector at the moment is we're seeing students who have come out of the school system and they've been narrowed down to a field through the university and then they go into a PhD and they get even narrower. And you start to talk to them about certain things outside that space and they just don't have the context. But that lived context and that broad experience is what makes a lot of people really, really valuable um, in emergency management situations. So to me, building that capability um, of giving people opportunities to stretch and learn more than their immediate field is really important. And that comes back to the WA Radar project um, that we had last year and we had um, a mobile radio in Western Australia. And DBCA over there were doing a really, really nice job of developing some of their young people and they got a couple of their young guys involved in the project. And it was fantastic to see these you know, pretty young practitioners out talking to international experts in radar um, and it's just a really inc incredible experience to see you know these 20 year olds talking to 60 year olds and sharing that experience one on one and I think there's those lim those opportunities are actually really quite limited now for the next generation of people coming through. Um, you will also, for the, I think, for the next, next crowd of people coming through, it's about when and where to reach out. So I was up in Queensland, I think it was at the beginning of Black Summer, um, and one of uh, we've been thinking about next two days. Next two days were just critically important in terms of the fire weather and what the fires were going to do and what the plumes were going to look like. So my head was completely in that space. And one of the strategic guys came up to me and said, oh, we want to know what's going to happen over the next couple of months because we're looking at spending millions of dollars in bringing over firefighting resources from the United States. So we want to know what the weather's going to be. And I went, right, when do you need to know? And he goes, tomorrow's good. I said, all right, I'll get back to you. <laughs> um, and I went off and I called Carl Braganza, who heads up our climate section. And there was a young guy shadowing me at the time and he was following me around. And he looked at me and he goes, you're calling Carl Braganza? Like I had a direct line to God or something. And I said, yes, because Carl knows this space. He knows seasonal stuff much better than I do. Um, but the guy I was with, he would have answered the question off his own bat. So having those networks and knowing what you know and what you don't know and when to reach out and who to reach out to is actually really important in getting the right information through. All right. How do we measure success? <laughs> Operational agencies often focus on incremental change. They want to do something a little bit better than what they do at the moment. Um, but at some point, we're going to have to have a paradigm shift in the way that we do things. And that really does require ambition and vision. Um, and some of that is probably going to happen in the machine learning space and the artificial intelligence space. Um, but I've seen a number of examples where people have come in and said, all right, we're going to apply machine learning to some of the problems that you guys have got, and it doesn't work. And we've got a lot over 100 years um, of scientific, physical science um, that any kind of new approach needs to be added on to. So I don't think the machine learning and artificial intelligence is going to solve our problems. Um, we've actually got to integrate it with what we know from a physical science point of view. It's also about how you measure success. I think one of the really nice examples of success um, measures that I've seen was the RFS after Black Summer, they did a study and they didn't just look at the number of homes that were burned, which was something like two or 3,000. They also looked at the number of homes that were saved, which was 14,000. So it's that different way of saying, how do you measure success? Yes, you can measure loss, but there's also that reflection on what, what was saved is actually really important. Um, and again, my bias, one of the things is that academic research papers are really easy to count. And when I was in Portugal for the conference there a couple of years ago, they had a woman scientist, can't remember her name, from Europe who did a keynote. And she was talking about her experience as a senior woman in the sector, um, doing fire research in what is very much in Europe in particular, a male dominated area. And all of her talk focused on the statistics in publications comparing men to women. And it just made me reflect on the fact that her experience in working as a woman in the sector compared to my experience in working as a woman in the sector is completely different because I've got a really small publication record. <laughs> um, but I think I've had a lot more fun than what she has. So I think... <laughs> I think it's also about recognising success and I think I am lucky that I work in an organisation where impact and value isn't just measured in the number of publications that you do, but it's also about how the research is used and shared. All right, take homes. 
as I mentioned, I think how do, who, do we inf who do we include in the next round of conversations? And I think it's got to be outside, just researchers and practitioners, and start tapping into some of the other people. And, and I've had some really interesting conversations recently with people in the insurance industry, and they're really interested in the work that we do for obvious reasons. How do we balance blue, si blue sky research um, and the really things, things that are really hard to do with applied research, which has got immediate value, and also sharing the learnings? In my mind, people development, developing the next generation is critically important across research and operations with people who can flex across those different spaces. And really making sure that we're developing people who can do the complex science um, and move away from just the traffic light bits, but that complexity of science is what is really, really d delivers useful information when we need it. And building effective networks. So to provide that research legacy. And I'd, anyway, to put the cartoon up, I think that the people who are in positions of power influence can be a lot less horrible if they've got good science supporting them. Thanks. <laughs>